In this section, I'm going to talk about multiplication cycles of select viruses. We call them multiplication cycles instead of life cycles because, if you remember, we don't consider viruses living. So we'll refer to them as multiplication cycles, but basically they're like the quote-unquote life cycle of the virus. So general phases in the life cycle of animal viruses, I'm going to give you brief definitions up front and then we'll talk more specifically about what each one of these is. First, adsorption. Adsorption is when the virus sticks to the surface of the host cell. It has to stick to the surface of the host cell and has to be the correct host cell with the correct receptors. It won't be able to stick if the spikes do not recognize the receptor on the surface of the host cell. Penetration. Penetration is when the virus enters into the host cell. Uncoating is when the capsid deteriorates and goes away, leaving the genetic material. Synthesis is when you replicate the genetic material. Assembly is when you assemble new viruses or new virions using the directions from the genetic material and also creating those um, viral proteins to create the capsid and spikes and so forth. So it's going to assemble the new viral particles. And then released is when the virus is released from the host cell. So adsorption. Invasion begins when the virus encounters a susceptible host and absorbs, adsorbs specifically to the receptor sites on the host membrane. Adsorb means to attach, absorb means to soak in like a paper towel. So here you go, is a really good picture of the receptor, and then you can see the spike and how specific their interaction is. A virus can invade its host cell only through making uh, an exact fit with a specific host molecule. It's a restricted host range, so hepatitis B only infects liver cells of humans, um, as an example. Moderately restrictive host range, polio virus can infect intestinal and nerve cells of primates. A broad host range would be ver uh, rabies, which the virus can infect various cells of all mammals. So we have different levels of um, how restrictive the host range can be. So restricted, moderately restrictive, and broad host. So penetration and encoding. This happens differently whether it's an enveloped virus or a non-enveloped virus, or also known as a naked virus. So up here is a picture of a naked virus. A naked virus will stick to the surface of the cell, and then it will be brought in by endocytosis. So the entire virus is engulfed by the cell. If this virus has an envelope, which is pictured here, the envelope will fuse with the cell membrane because after all, it is part of a host cell membrane. So when this happens, it'll fuse together and then the capsid, the nucleocapsid will be the only thing that enters into the cell, not the, um, not the envelope. The envelope will then fuse into the membrane and it'll stay there. Synthesis, it's the replication and protein production, so viral nucleic acid takes control over the host synthetic and metabolic machinery. The host cell can no longer function as a host cell. It's functioning as a virus producing factory. So the mechanism varies depending on whether the virus is a DNA or RNA virus. RNA viruses replicate in the cytoplasm, DNA viruses replicate in the nucleus. All of the uh, DNA replication machinery is going to be found in the nucleus of a host cell because that's where our DNA is. So in the, the case of DNA viruses, they actually have to get their genetic material into our nucleus. RNA viruses can just make copies of themselves in our cytosol. Now once these virus particles or these virions have uh, synthesized and assembled, they're ready to be released. Enveloped viruses are uh, released by budding or exocytosis. So the nucleocapsid binds to the membrane, a small pinch is formed, pinching off the pouch releases the virus with its envelope. So it actually forms right here on the surface of the cell membrane and as it pinches out, it's gonna release the particle, taking part of the whole cell membrane with it. And here's a stained electron micrograph picture 
of all of these viral particles budding off of the surface of the host cell. As for naked viruses, naked viruses will just build up and build up and build up inside of that host cell and then rupture the host cell. So it's a lot less um, graceful than what happens with the budding, but they'll build up and then they'll just burst open out of the host cell all at once. So that host cell um, dies a lot faster. Some of the damage that can be caused to the host cell. So there's cytopathic effects. Cytopathic effects are things that you can see from a microscope how the cell visually looks different. So virus induced damage to the cell that alters its microscopic appearance. The cells can become disoriented, they can undergo major changes in shape or size, or develop intracellular damage. Inclusion bodies are such intracellular damage, so they're compacted masses of viruses and damaged organelles in the nucleus or cytoplasm. Some viruses can cause inclusion bodies to form. Now inclusion bodies, you won't be able to see individual virions, but you will be able to see a big mass of what looks like garbage in the cytosol of the cell and that garbage contains viruses and cell organelles that are damaged and dead. Synctia is when the cells fuse together, so certain viruses have the ability to make cells fuse together. Here's a picture of synctia. An example of a virus that does this is the respiratory synctial virus. And then inclusion bodies, these are pretty common to be found in numerous virally infected cells. So some cytopathic changes in select virus infected animal cells. You can read through this table and kind of take a look at um, how the animal cell responds to the presence of that virus. I won't specifically ask you any questions about this table, but I encourage you to read through it just so you can get a deeper understanding of the effects that viruses have on animal cells. Persistent infections, so a carrier relationship that develops in some cells, the cell harbors the virus and is not immediately lysed. A provirus is when the viral DNA is incorporated into the DNA of the host, and then it enters into a chronic latent state, a periodic reactivation after a period of viral inactivity. So let's think about this for a minute. You have your host cell. and you have your nucleus inside of your host cell. Now you have a virus. And that virus is going to get into your host cell. And the first thing that happens to that virus is it loses its capsid. So all that remains now is genetic material. How is your immune system gonna know to fight that genetic material? It's not. Unless this genetic material is immediately turned into viruses and then your immune system can say, hey, I'm infected, and then a lot of your cells will hold up this um, MHC1 complex and they'll hold up a chunk of the virus and say, hey, I'm infected, come um, take care of this virus over here. But if it's just a piece of genetic material, your immune system can't see it and your host cell can't alert your body that you're infected. Now let's say this piece of genetic material it could be RNA, which could be reverse transcribed into DNA, or it could be just straight up DNA. Now let's say it gets into your nucleus. Well, what do you have in your nucleus? DNA. So now you have DNA next to DNA. And unfortunately, DNA is DNA no matter what organism you're looking at. So it's the same four bases, the same structure, that same backbone structure, phospho, um, phosphate and um, deoxyribose sugar. So it's identical. Your body can't distinguish between DNA from DNA. So it's tough to be able to locate the virus when it's in this, in this um, form. So now this DNA is inside of your nucleus. It can easily be incorporated into your genome. And sometimes incorporation cause, causes cell death. Sometimes it causes cancer. Sometimes it just stays there and nothing happens for many, 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 many years. And then all of a sudden, there's a reactivation of this. That reactivation after the chronic latent state can cause viral replication and release of the viruses. So these viruses can stay inside of your cells for so long because all that's inside of your cell at that point is a piece of genetic material. And that genetic material is indistinguishable from your genetic material. 
with the exception of the sequence of it and um, bacteria have actually developed certain types of enzymes that we'll learn about that can recognize viral DNA and kill it, or sorry, not kill it, um, <laughs> destroy it. But for the most part, our cells are kind of defenseless against this, especially when it gets incorporated into our host you know, DNA, our own genome. So viruses and cancer, oncogenic viruses, expert, experts estimate that up to 13% of human cancers are caused by viruses. Oncogenic, um, cancer causing is what it's really referring to. Transformation, transformation is when the virus carries genes that directly cause cancer. It, the virus produces proteins that induce a loss of growth regulation in the cell. So those are some of the things that can happen to animal cells. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about a bacterial phage. A bacterial phage is a virus that infects bacteria. It was discovered in 1915, and it can parasitize every known bacterial species. It's often made of, or they often make the bacteria they infect more pathogenic for humans. The T even bacterial phage infect E. coli, T2 and T4. They're the most widely studied bacterial phage, and they go through similar stages as the, as the animal virus. The major difference here is because bacterial cells are so small, the bacterial phage does not actually enter into the bacterial cell. It looks like this, kind of looks like a creepy spider, like an alien dude. So it'll clamp onto the surface of the cell and it will inject its genetic material into the cytoplasm. And once the genetic material is in there, it will tell the uh, bacterium to produce more viral particles. So very similar to what happens to us, except it doesn't actually enter the cell. It just stays on the outside and injects in its um, genetic material. Bacterial phages are important for a couple different reasons. Like the previous slide said, they make bacteria more pathogenic to people. We don't know a lot about this, and um, there's research abound around the topic, so I'm sure that we'll find out more about it um, eventually, but that's something to think about is it makes them more um, pathogenic or more dangerous for people. Another thing is bacterial phages have the potential to kill bacteria. There was some talk uh, a couple years back that talked about whether we should use bacterial phages to kill bacteria in our food. So the bacterial phages would be sprinkled on the bacteria and uh, that, that's on the surface of our food and thought was that the bacterial phage would end up killing the bacteria. Well, there's a lot of scary thoughts around that, like um, you're injecting basically genetic material and possibly making the bacteria more pathogenic, and then how do you ensure that all those bacteria are actually dead, and what's the success rate of bacterial phages killing bacteria, and all sorts of other things arose like uh, around that topic, but it was an idea that was out for um, quite a couple years. Uh, and. Hopefully they don't go forward with it without further research. This is a picture of a weakened bacterial cell that's crowded with viruses. So here's the bacterial cell, and then those are the bacterial phages.